posterior approach to the shoulder joint. This video has been produced from a book source. I would like to express my gratitude to the editors Stanley Hoppenfeld, Piet de Boer, Richard Buckley and the illustrator Hugh A. Thomas. Notice the citation below. The posterior aspect of the shoulder, similar to the anterior and lateral aspects, is covered by two muscular sleeves. The posterior part of the deltoid muscle forms the outer sleeve of muscle, as it does for all other approaches to the shoulder joint. The inner sleeve consists of two muscles of the rotator cuff, the infraspinatus and the teres minor figures. The posterior aspect of the shoulder, similar to the anterior and lateral aspects, is covered by two muscular sleeves. The posterior part of the deltoid muscle forms the outer sleeve of muscle, as it does for all other approaches to the shoulder joint. The inner sleeve consists of two muscles of the rotator cuff, the infraspinatus and the teres minor figures. Landmark and incision. Landmark. The spine of the scapula is a thick, bony ridge projecting from the back of the blade of the scapula. Its base runs almost horizontally and its free lateral border curves forward to form the acromion. The spine separates the supraspinous fossa from the infraspinous fossa. The trapezius muscle inserts into it from above. Part of the deltoid muscle originates from its inferior border. See figures. Figure. The posterior portion of the deltoid is detached from the spine of the scapula, revealing the infraspinatus, teres minor and teres major muscles, as well as the long and lateral heads of the triceps muscle. The boundaries of the quadrangular space are, superiorly, the lower border of the teres minor, laterally the surgical neck of the humerus, medially the long head of the triceps, and anteriorly the upper border of the teres major. Through this space run the axillary nerve and the posterior circumflex humeral artery. Incision. Because the transverse skin incision runs across the lines of cleavage of the skin, the resultant scar usually is broad. A vertical incision at the lateral end of the scapular spine is more cosmetic, but provides poor exposure of the joint. Infraspinatus origin medial three-fourths of infraspinous fossa of scapula insertion central facet on greater tuberosity of humerus action lateral rotator of humerus nerve supply suprascapular nerve teres minor origin axillary border of scapula insertion lowest facet on greater tuberosity of humerus action lateral rotator of humerus nerve supply axillary nerve superficial surgical dissection in the posterior approach, only those fibers of thedeltoid muscle that arise from the spine of the scapula are detached. Because the fibers are straight and blend intimately with the periosteum of the scapula, the muscle can be removed subperiosteally. During closure, the good, tough tissue that remains attached to the muscle provides an excellent anchor for sutures in contrast to the anterior and lateral portions of the muscle. Drill holes may need to be placed through the spine, however, to anchor the muscular sutures. Deep surgical dissection. The deep dissection in this approach lies between the infraspinatus and teres minor muscles, see Fig. 1, 66. Infraspinatus muscle. The fibers of the infraspinatus muscle are multi-pennate. Numerous fibrous intramuscular septa give attachment to them. The infraspinatus forms its tendon just before, crossing the back of the shoulder joint. A small bursa lies between the muscle and the posterior aspect of the scapular neck to help the tendon glide freely over the bone. The muscle also inserts into the capsule of the shoulder joint, mechanically increasing the capsule's strength. Fig. 1, 67. Teres minor muscle. The teres minor runs side by side with the infraspinatus. Its fibers run parallel with one another, in contrast to the multi-pennate fibers of the infraspinatus. This difference may help in identification of the interval between the two muscles. The axillary nerve enters the muscle from its inferior border. The superior border, the boundary between the infraspinatus and teres minor muscles, therefore, is the safe side of the muscle and a true internervous plane. See figure. Figure. The lateral portion of the infraspinatus and the teres minor has been removed to reveal the joint capsule. 
the suprascapular nerve and the circumflex scapular artery are seen curving medially and distally around the lateral border of the spine of the scapula. The axillary nerve is seen emerging through the quadrangular space and splitting into many branches. The medial branch splits to supply the teres minor muscle. The radial nerve is seen crossing through the triangular space and entering the spiral groove in the upper portion of the humerus. The triangular space is formed superiorly by the lower border of the teres major muscle, medially by the long head of the triceps, and laterally by the shaft of the humerus. Dangers Axillary nerve The axillary nerve is a branch of the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. It runs down along the posterior wall of the axilla on the surface of the subscapularis, far from the incision made in that muscle during the anterior approach to the shoulder. The nerve then runs through the quadrangular space, where it touches the surgical neck of the humerus. At that point it can be damaged easily by surgery, by fractures of the surgical neck of the humerus, or by anterior dislocation of the shoulder. The boundaries of the quadrangular space differ when viewed from the front and from the back. See figure. Posterior view. The boundaries from the posterior view are as follows. Superiorly, the lower border of the teres minor, laterally the surgical neck of the humerus, medially the long head of the triceps, and inferiorly the upper border of the teres major, anterior view. The boundaries from the anterior view are as follows. Superiorly, the subscapularis. Laterally, the surgical neck of the humerus. Medially, the long head of the triceps, and inferiorly the upper border of the teres major, see figure. The axillary nerve disappears beneath the lower border of the subscapularis, and after traversing the quadrangular space, emerges in the back of the shoulder, beneath the lower border of the teres minor. The posterior circumflex humeral vessels run with it, see figure. Posterior view. The boundaries from the posterior view are as follows. Superiorly, the lower border of the teres minor, laterally the surgical neck of the humerus, medially the long head of the triceps, and inferiorly the upper border of the teres major, anterior view. The boundaries from the anterior view are as follows. Superiorly the subscapularis, laterally the surgical neck of the humerus, medially the long head of the triceps, and inferiorly the upper border of the teres major, see figure. The axillary nerve disappears beneath the lower border of the subscapularis and after traversing the quadrangular space emerges in the back of the shoulder beneath the lower border of the teres minor. The posterior circumflex humeral vessels run with it, see figure. Dissections carried out above the teres minor do not damage the axillary nerve. However, if the dissection strays out of the E correct plane and below the teres minor, the axillary nerve can be damaged. Because the axillary nerve is the sole nerve supplied to the deltoid muscle, any damage will produce severe functional impairments. Within the quadrangular space, the axillary nerve divides into two branches after giving off a twig to the shoulder joint. The deep branch enters and supplies the deep surface of the deltoid, see figure. The superficial branch supplies the teres minor muscle and sends a cutaneous branch to the lateral aspect of the upper arm, namely the upper lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm, which supplies the skin over the insertion of the deltoid muscle, see figure. The upper lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm is of clinical importance in cases of traumatic axillary nerve palsy, following, for instance, an acute anterior dislocation of the shoulder. Examination of the paralyzed deltoid and teres minor muscles may be difficult or impossible because of the pain that follows this injury. Diminution of sensation over the insertion of the deltoid is good presumptive evidence of the presence of an axillary nerve palsy. Radial nerve. The radial nerve, which is the other major branch of the posterior cord of the brachial plexus, leaves the axilla by passing backward through a triangular space that is defined superiorly by the lower border of the teres major, laterally by the shaft of the humerus, and medially by the long head of the triceps. See figures. The odds of endangering the radial nerve by this approach are remote. It cannot be damaged during the posterior approach to the shoulder, 
unless the correct plane is deviated from substantially below, not only the teres minor but the teres major as well. Radial nerve. The radial nerve, which is the other major branch of the posterior cord of the brachial plexus, leaves the axilla by passing backward through a triangular space that is defined superiorly by the lower border of the teres major, laterally by the shaft of the humerus, and medially by the long head of the triceps. See figures. The odds of endangering the radial nerve by this approach are remote. It cannot be damaged during the posterior approach to the shoulder unless the correct plane is deviated from substantially below, not only the teres minor but the teres major as well. Because the scapula has such a rich blood supply, fractures of the scapula are often associated with profuse blood loss. The hematoma is constrained within the fascia surrounding the scapular muscles and is not obvious. Potential blood loss from a fractured scapula always must be considered during vascular assessment of a polytraumatized patient. I would like to express my gratitude to the editors, Stanley Hoppenfeld, Piet de Boer, Richard Buckley, and the illustrator Hugh A. Thomas. Notice the citation below. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to my channel, Orthopedics Trauma, in YouTube.